Shocker, they are. Every one of my closed ecosystems, well, except for the largest, it wouldn't fit in this shot very well, and besides, I want to keep that one hidden until the end. We're going to be going through each of these one by one, and I'll be rating each of these ecosystems on a one to five scale for their biodiversity, the diversity of life inside, at least the life that we can see, irrespective of the time that has passed since these closed ecosystems were, well, closed. I'll talk more about the scale as we go along, but let's get started. So here's the smallest ecosystem I have. This is something my now five-year-old daughter and I threw together over the summer, so about seven, eight months ago. And, well, there's not much to see. There's plenty of plant life, including moss and grass, and here's an earthworm and another worm. This is the only shot I got of it, so it could be a young earthworm, or it could be a type of white worm called a pot worm, but that's it. That is it in terms of diversity of animal life in this uh, small jar. I did lots of searching, which looked like this, but even with the macro lens, I didn't have any success. Not even a springtail or a mite, which are usually pretty hardy and common creatures. So, for the smallest of my ecosystems, I'm giving this one a 1.5 out of 5 on the biodiversity scale. The next largest is this stream ecosphere. As you can see, this is an aquatic ecosystem, not a closed terrarium or earth-based system. Now, initially, this jar was filled with a surprising amount and variety of life. Uh, that included bladder snails, hydras, uh, some different insect larvae, a flatworm, and, and much more. But as time has progressed, the biodiversity has decreased significantly. This is probably due to the fact that many of those organisms that had survived in this jar for at least a short while were dependent on a low temperature, high flow rate environment, the stream that I gathered them from, which is conducive to higher oxygen levels in the water. And of course, uh, being indoors and sitting in a jar, there's no flow of the water and it's probably a warmer temperature than they would be used to. And so today, much of this jar is slowly being taken over by this filamentous algae. In terms of biodiversity, we have a number of bladder snails as well as a limpet snail that are continuing to survive. Uh, some copepods can be seen bouncing around too, but other than that, there's not much else except for very small microorganisms such as those seen in this shot, probably some sort of ciliate. There could be more variety than I'm missing. The dense forest of algae makes it a little difficult to look for other life, especially the hydra, which look very similar to the algae. But I'm not seeing any of the ostracods or other small organisms that are frequently found in an aquatic ecosystem. So I'm giving this jar a 2 out of 5 on the biodiversity scale. But moving on, next up is the oldest of my closed ecosystems. This jar is now over one and a half years in age, and despite that, life continues in this jar. It is host to two bladder snails that, despite being capable of asexual reproduction, thus far appear to be having a hard time reproducing. There are also a number of copepods that can be seen, most of these are probably filter feeders feeding on tiny plankton floating in the water. Also visible on the glass is some phytoplankton, a favorite food for the bladder snails. More on that later. The oxygen production from this clump of algae can be easily visualized in this shot, with the bubble seeming to add buoyancy to the green blob. But disappointingly, this jar lacks some of the diversity seen in the past, such as seen in this shot or this right here, which is a tubifex worm. But that's often the case in these closed ecosystems, as we'll see later. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll give this jar a two out of five on the biodiversity scale. And speaking of less diverse ecosystems, here's another great example of that trend I was talking about, less diversity over time. This is the wasteland ecosystem. This is the oldest of my terrestrial, my land-based ecosystems. And as you can see, it used to look much less green and much more, well, dead, hence the name, the Wasteland Terrarium. But amazingly, over a year and a half time, it still harbors life. 
but that diversity has decreased over time. Inside, we can see isopods, centipedes, mites, and springtails, and this, a type of white worm commonly called a pot worm. But that's about it. After a year and a half, I think the populations in this jar have sort of stabilized, and I hope the diversity doesn't decrease further anytime soon. But like I said, the time takes a toll on the diversity of any of these closed ecosystems. For the biodiversity scale, I'm giving this a 2.5 out of 5, which isn't bad for being nearly two years old, but still much less diversity than even six months or a year ago. But I think it's time for an ecosystem that does have a little more diversity. This is a pond ecosystem, and it's a little over three months it's since old. it was from a relatively shallow pond in a swampy area. This jar's inhabitants are, are sort of unique. How so? Well, I'll show you in a minute. But first off, uh, this jar has the standard aquatic animals uh, that you would find in many of these closed ecosystems. There's both ram's horn and bladder snails to keep the algae and plant populations in check. And uh, we have some crawling water beetles that feed on some of the zooplankton inside. But what's really interesting about this jar isn't what's under the water, it's what's above. This is a springtail. Springtails are tiny insects that live everywhere on Earth, for the most part, on all seven continents of the world. And more specifically, this species thrives on and near the surface of ponds. Uh, but that's not all for life above the waterline. Here's another bug. I'm not so sure this is an aquatic bug. Most likely in its larval form, uh, this bug was living in the water or the mud. And now, in its what would seem to be its adult form, well, it's sort of out of luck. Uh, likewise for this winged insect. And not pictured is another winged insect uh, that I wasn't able to get on film. Uh, but before anyone gets up in arms about the ethics of keeping these winged insects in a jar, I'll go ahead and remind you that it's January. And I live in Minnesota. So they're going to survive much longer here in this jar than out in the cold. But moving on, I'm going to go ahead and give this pond in a jar a score of 3.5 on the biodiversity scale. And as an aside, I'm sort of curious to see how long those springtails will be able to maintain a breeding population above the waterline. Next on the list is my largest aquatic ecosystem. This one has the benefit of having the most lively groups of plants, and that seems to be helping a variety of other creatures inside to survive and thrive. Maybe the most plentiful of animals in this jar is the amphipod. This is actually the only aquatic ecosystem of mine that contains this creature, despite the fact that they're pretty common in a lot of the freshwater bodies of water in my locale. You can sort of think of these as tiny freshwater shrimp. They're busy little guys, buzzing around and scavenging on detritus and maybe some small plankton. In fact, I suspect the number of amphipods in this jar are actually outcompeting some other small animals like copepods or daphnia. I only spotted a few copepods in this jar and no daphnia whatsoever. And I'm thinking that they probably share a similar source of food. They both feed on detritus or small zoo and, and phytoplankton. And the amphipods, because of the sheer number of them, are just simply outcompeting some of the other creatures. I could be wrong. Uh, the crawling water beetles might also contribute to this depopulation of, of those species. I also found this beetle in here. I'm not sure exactly what the species is, though. This is a really good shot of a bladder snail that lives in this jar. It's feeding on this brown matter on the glass, and it might look like gunk or waste matter, but it's actually the phytoplankton that I was referring to earlier in this video. And in this case, this type of phytoplankton is called diatoms. They're, they're a tiny type of phytoplankton that use silicon to craft their structure, much in the same way that a plant would use um, some sort of carbon-based structure. I'm also curious as to whether any tube effects worms live in the substrate. As you can see, it has a number of small tunnels, no doubt from tube effects worms, but 
these tunnels could be months old and I wasn't able to find any living specimens inside. This lovely and lively jar is doing quite well overall and I'm giving it a three out of five on my biodiversity scale. But let's up the ante. This is the second largest of my ecosystems and it is loaded with life and diversity. It's got mites, uh, two species, I think, at least two springtail species, uh, both flat and round-backed millipedes, weevils, isopods, worms. Uh, by the way, I love this shot of this worm up against the glass here. So cool. And this creature here, if we look closer, <laughs> I, I, I tricked you. It's not a new creature. It's actually just an isopod. And but check out my favorite creature in this enclosure. This spider has survived fairly well in this closed and humid ecosystem, probably helping keep springtail and other bug populations in check. But wait, there's more. I also spotted a flying insect in here. It probably was put in this enclosure as a larva or an egg, and it's unfortunately destined to live out its natural life in this small environment. But what I've listed so far isn't it for this terrarium. There's also snails, slugs, and centipedes, though I wasn't able to get good footage of any of them. This is easily the most diverse enclosure I have. So, what would I rate it on the biodiversity scale? Well, I'd give it a 4.5 out of 5, an almost perfect score. And I'm also going to add a big ol' asterisk, because... Okay, this isn't an exactly closed ecosystem, and in reality, since I put this together this past summer, I've since been adding a ton of both dead plant matter and bugs as sort of an experimental ecosystem that could also seed future ecosystems. This would enable me to make a new ecosystem in a jar or a similar container, even if it's the middle of winter in northern Minnesota. So as far as the biodiversity scale goes, this doesn't shouldn't really be counted. It's not fair. It's cheating. It's not closed like the other systems I have. But I thought I'd show it to you anyways. Finally, though, we've come to the largest of my ecosystems. This is the 18-gallon Northern Forest Closed Terrarium. And I've had this for well over a year and a half. The plant life has been thriving as of late. Here are some flowers that are wilting now, but were in bloom for well over a month, longer than I'm guessing they would have been if it was in the wild. Uh, this ecosystem is also home to a broad variety of fungi, which helps to break down some of the waste inside. And as for animal life, the diversity has decreased in the past year. But like some of these other ecosystems, it seems like it's stabilized. Isopods and springtails scurry across the soil and plants looking for detritus to feed on. Earthworms uh, churn up the soil as they cause a constant change in the terrain. Centipedes lurk in darkness, only coming out to hunt. As far as food goes, these centipedes mostly feed on springtails, helping keep their populations in check. I found some mites in here too, but sadly, much of the diversity in this enclosure has been lost over time. Weevils, millipedes, snails, and rove beetles that inhabited this ecosystem only months before appear to be extinct. So on the biodiversity scale, the largest of my enclosures gets a 3 out of 5. But here's the thing about life. We know that life can't arise from nothing, and that's certainly the case in these ecosystems. But that's not the end of the story for some of these species. See, the good news for the weevils, tubifex worms, millipedes, or other species that I am pretty sure are extinct in these closed ecosystems is that I could be wrong. Species could reappear seemingly from nowhere because I missed something. And, and if not, if they're gone for good in these miniature worlds, these glass oases, the cool thing is that life in some form, will still continue to survive and thrive indefinitely. <laughs>